I've been thinking about Formula 1 point systems a lot recently. In my last few videos, I've been looking at proposed new systems for next year, and I've been trawling through the history of F1 with all its weird and wonderful ways of crowning a champion. So I decided it was about time to review every point system. The only way I know how. Is it better to reward consistency? Or maybe we should be rewarding those with an all or nothing attitude towards racing. Should we place more emphasis on qualifying? Less? Or maybe we should be aiming for something altogether more silly. When I say every point system, I'm of course talking about ones you've already heard of, F1's current point system, proposals for the future, point systems from F1 seasons gone past, but I'm also talking about systems you might not have thought of, point systems from other forms of motorsport, or even things that have nothing to do with motorsport at all. What would F1 look like with the point system from Super Mario Brothers? Stay tuned to find out. Obviously, if we're testing out loads of different systems, we need a solid baseline. That's science, baby. So we need to apply them all to the same season. We need something close at the top, so we can see if there's any differences. And so we're going to be applying all of these point systems to the last season with a proper title battle. 2021. A nice, simple season with no controversies. No one's going to get angry at me in the comments this time. As the topic of the 2021 Drivers' Champion is one that people have strong opinions about. This experiment will also be interesting so it shows us if Max Verstappen is still the champion all across the multiverse or if Lewis Hamilton can take the title across different dimensions should help to ease some doubts in a few people's minds. And so, where do we start? Formula 1 2021. For reference, let's start with the obvious. The 2021 point system, you know, the one that was used in 2021, is almost the same as the one we have now in 2024. It gives out these points to the top 10 finishers and one point for a fastest lap. The only difference to 2024 is the sprint races give out less points. Three points for first, then two, then one. Belgium gets half points, even though they definitely did not do half a race, and there you go. As this was the point system used in 2021, it should come as no surprise to you that Max Verstappen is the world champion with this system. I know you know this, but I thought for the sake of completeness we should have this one on the board just in case, somehow, you forgot the result of this season. For those curious, if we apply the updated 2024 regulations to 2021, Max Verstappen is still the champion. Sprint races give out more points, which is better for Max, but under the new regulations, Belgium would score zero, as it did not have two laps without a safety car. Therefore, Lewis would have gone into Abu Dhabi not level, but instead leading by three points, but that doesn't change the fact that Max won that race and therefore still wins the championship by five. So that's today's point system. But is it as good as? Formula 1 1950. We've seen the systems in the 72nd and 75th seasons of Formula 1, but how about the point system in the first season? Things were a little different back then. Eight points for the winner, then six, four, three, two. Finished any lower than fifth? That's a skill issue, no points for you. There was still a point for fastest lap in 1950, which is obviously worth more in proportion to how many points you get for first. No mention of sprint races back then, so we're just going to say they're worth nothing. Oh, and one other thing. Only your four best results count towards your championship standing. Yes, yes, I know. This system was designed when there were only seven races, not 22. But it says four in the regulations, and we're using these systems exactly as they're written down. Therefore, four best results only. Obviously, when we apply these points to 2021, both Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton have at least four wins each. But Lewis Hamilton only has a fastest lap in one of those races, whereas Verstappen has a fastest lap in three. Therefore, 35 to 33, Max Verstappen is the champion. I do quite like a system like this that doesn't use all of the races because it helps to balance out some of those DNFs that aren't necessarily your fault. But obviously, only four results is a little bit low in a season with 22 races. In theory, we could have had five different drivers with four wins each going into Abu Dhabi, where we would have just had Chaos. Actually, no, come to think of it, that sounds pretty good. The 1950 system therefore gives an interesting perspective, but is it as good as? Formula 1 1988. As we've done the first season and some of the later seasons of Formula 1, I thought it'd be good to look at a season right in the middle, which puts us somewhere around 1987 or 1988. The point system stayed unchanged throughout the whole of the 80s, so it doesn't really matter which. Nine points for the winner, all the way down to sixth. 
Formula 1 was stingy with points back in the day. Midfield teams, count yourself lucky. No points for fastest lap this time, and again, nothing for the sprints, and only your 11 best results count towards the championship, a rule which helped to write a series of controversial title battles at the end of the 80s. So, what does this system do? Does Lewis pull the old Ayrton on Max and win the title despite having a less consistent season? No. Hamilton, 90 points. Verstappen, 93. Four different stops across the multiverse already, and Verstappen is champion in all of them. I'm starting to think this guy might be a decent driver. All right, all right. Actual point systems from Formula One's history, they're good and all, but are they as good as? F1 medals. All right, our first stop into the realms of fiction. The medal system was proposed by everyone's favorite racing impersonator, Bernie Eccleston. Basically, you win a race, you get a medal. At the end of the season, the driver with the most medals, i.e. the most wins, is the champion. This is the exact opposite of rewarding consistency, as it encourages an all or nothing approach at the front of the field. Nowadays, if you're running in second place, you may as well just hold position and keep hold of those 18 points. It could come in handy later. In the medal system, second place is worth nothing. Well, almost nothing. It's quite easy to work out the 2021 champion in this system. Max Verstappen has the most wins, 10, therefore he's a champion. This proposal made sense back in the days of unlimited engines, refueling, push laps, every lap. Realistically, you could pull out some crazy sprint where you overtake first, right at the line, and then your engine just explodes. Nowadays though, with a budget cap, only three engines for the season, engine mode limitations, no refueling, tires, which on some tracks can't even do one lap at a full push. Teams are forced to be a little bit more conservative with what they have their drivers do. Yes, in a modern Formula 1 car, you can turn the settings up to 11 and do some crazy push where you might take first place, but then you might be left with no more engines halfway through the season and a cost cap penalty for the next year. Not really worth it. All in all, not ideal, but an interesting proposal. Cheers, Bernie. But is it as good as Formula 1 2025, potentially, or Formula 2? All right, let's just rattle off a couple more Formula 1 related ideas real quick. As I described in my video about this proposal, Formula 1 might be getting a new point system as early as next year, with points all the way down to P12. If we apply that system to 2021, Max Verstappen is the champion. Formula 2 is the main feeder series to get into Formula 1. Your success with that may vary. So they have a system very similar to F1. The only difference is they have a sprint weekend every weekend, and therefore they have a few more points on offer for it. Points down to P8 in the sprint with 10 points for the winner, and you can get a fastest lap point on Saturday as well as Sunday. There's also a bonus two points if you qualify on pole for the future race on Sunday, which brings the maximum possible points in a weekend to 39. Apply that all to Formula 1 2021, and it looks something like this. Again, Max wins by a greater margin. He has better sprint race results and also has more pole positions, picking up loads of those juicy, juicy bonus points. Okay, okay, that's all well and good, but I think I've had enough of open wheel racing for now. Two points for a pole position is a nice little idea, maybe we could push that even further. This is a nice system, but is it as good as? The International Motorsports Association Sports Car Championship is a US-based multi-class semi-endurance championship, that's a mouthful, and I've chosen it to go on this list because it gives out tons of points. 350 points for the win, all the way down to 110 for P20. Oh, and also qualifying points for the entire grid. You gotta be good on both Saturday and Sunday here, baby. If we apply this to the 2021 season, we get, wait, what the hell? Lewis Hamilton, world champion. For the first time in this experiment, we have a change at the top. Basically, the IMSA point system, when applied to a 20-car grid, emphasizes reliability above anything else. You still get 110 points even if you finish right at the back. So the main thing is, you've got to finish. In 2021, Max had two non-classified races to Lewis's one, and funnily enough, he finishes about one race worth of points behind. If Max had been classified in either Britain or Italy, even as low as 12th, he would have won the championship. I think this is a nice example to show us some of the issues with a system that gives up points for every finishing position, and so many points at that. It can turn a series into a don't DNF championship, which doesn't always make for the best racing. Plus, something like this can encourage teams to fix their cars and send them back out on track even if they're not necessarily safe to drive. This is an issue in Formula 1 more so than maybe any other motorsport. These cars are not just a sheet of aluminum wrapped around an engine block. 
they're a little bit more complicated than that. Oh, and also, they're quite fast, so it can be pretty bad if your front suspension wishbone snaps in half around a high-speed corner because it's held together with duct tape. IMSA, then, is a nice system that shows us some of the issues we need to avoid when designing a point system for Formula 1. I also like seeing a driver score thousands of points over a season, just very satisfying. It's nice, but is it as nice as? IndyCar is an open wheel racing series based in the US which probably gets the most direct comparisons to Formula 1, but would its point system be any good? With larger grids, IndyCar has points going the whole way down, but still with nice separation at the top to encourage you to push for P1. One point for pole position, one point if you lead at least one lap, and two points for the person who leads the most laps. We then have the special case of the Indy 500. The race after which this entire series gets its name, this one gets special treatment, with qualifying points all the way down to 12th. Formula 1 doesn't race at Indianapolis anymore, thank god, so we're going to have our qualifying bonus points at F1's favourite child instead, the Monaco Grand Prix. When we apply this system, again, with points all the way down to P20, Max's two DNFs hurt him, but he picks up an absolute buttload of bonus points from laps led and 11 points in the Monaco Grand Prix qualifying compared to Hamilton's six. All in all, Max wins comfortably on 917 points, a hefty 24 point gap to Lewis. IndyCar is a nice system, and it's the one that you guys suggest the most in the comments by far. I do like the bonus points for laps led and stuff like that, gives us an idea of who's the most well-rounded competitor. IndyCar has a few bonus points, but does it have as many as? The National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing has, by far, the most messed up point system we've seen so far. From time to time, you'll hear a NASCAR commentator or even a fan try and tell you that the point system is not that bad. They are lying. The NASCAR race is divided into three stages. Are each of those stages exactly one third of the race? <laughs> no, don't be silly. Stage one is the first 25% of the race, and stage two takes us up to halfway. At the end of each of those two stages, these points are handed out. Stage three is then the rest of the race, i.e. the second half, and when you reach a checkered flag, these points are handed out. Therefore, if you lead a race start to finish, you will in fact score 60 regular season points. Wait, regular season points? That implies there's a... Postseason, yes! NASCAR, which may I remind you is a motorsport, has a postseason. Why? America. So, during the regular season, you score regular season points, but also you can score postseason bonus points. One bonus point for winning either stage one or stage two, and five bonus points for winning stage three. Then, at the end of the regular season, the drivers with the most regular season points get even more bonus points based on this distribution. So, then, what is the postseason? Well, the actual NASCAR one consists of three rounds of three races each before a championship race, therefore 10 races in total. That's a bit much for Formula 1, as if we do that, that would mean the postseason starts in the Netherlands, almost halfway through the season. So, we're going to do one round of three races, starting on the Sunday race in Brazil, before a championship race in Abu Dhabi. That means drivers get one last-ditch attempt to qualify for the postseason at the sprint race in Brazil qualify, you say? Two things. I'm counting sprint races as a special one-stage exhibition race. You can still get one bonus postseason point, but it does not count as a race win. Then, the second thing. Not everyone qualifies for the postseason. Real NASCAR has 16 drivers qualify, with four getting knocked out after each round. As we only have one round, we're going to take eight drivers to then leave four for the championship race. So, how do you qualify? You may think that it's the top eight point scorers from the regular season. You would be wrong. Qualifications are first determined on number of wins, which is why NASCAR has the saying, you win, you're in. Once you run out of drivers with wins, then it's the winless drivers with the most points. Therefore, applying all of this to Formula 1 in 2021, our eight qualifiers are Verstappen, Hamilton, Bottas and Perez, obviously, but then also Ricardo and Ocon, with one win each with Sainz and Norris rounding out our winless drivers with the most points. When the postseason starts at the main race in Brazil, these eight drivers have their points reset to 2,000 plus their postseason bonus points. We then have our next three races as normal, no more bonus points, but we still have the rule where if you win, you automatically qualify. Hamilton wins all three of Brazil, Qatar and Saudi, so he gets through, and then everyone else is just on points. Going into our final race, our postseason race, our top four with the highest points from the postseason, and therefore a chance of taking the title, are Verstappen, Hamilton, Bottas, and Ocon? I'm not going to question it. These four then have their points reset to 5,000, no bonus points this time, and Abu Dhabi is a straight shootout to the flag. No more stage points, just the first person to finish. 
I'm not gonna hype it up, you know what happens. Verstappen wins the race and therefore he is the champion. We get a final standing with the NASCAR point system that looks like this. That's a lot to comprehend. I'm gonna take a second to breathe. <laughs> If someone ever tells you that the NASCAR point system is not complicated, cut that person out of your life. They are a filthy liar. That was fun, but is it as fun as... Formula 1 2021 points awarded every lap. Now, this may sound silly, and that's because it is. Basically, every time you cross the line, you could be up for 25 points. We might see some big numbers with this one. I'm still gonna give a point for the fastest lap in this system. Not the fastest lap every lap, that would be ludicrous. No, just one for the entire race. It's not worth as much considering the points on offer, but you never know. This was a bit of a weird one to calculate as I had to get the standing order from every lap of every race. Thankfully though, I'm a very sad, very nerdy man. And so I do have that exact data. Not for sprint races though, so I'm just gonna cut those out. The 2021 season had a total of 1,000 239 laps, so there was a little bit of adding up to do, but at the end of the season, these are the points. It basically looks the same again, what's going on? Well, I mean, the numbers don't. Max Verstappen takes the title with 24,069 points, nice, but the order of the drivers basically doesn't change. For me, also, the craziest part about this is that while Max Verstappen ends the season with a five-digit points tally, Nikita Mazepin still has zero. Zero. He didn't drive in the top 10 once, let alone finish there. I did not know that until I did this. That is mad. Again, big fan of any point system that gives us thousands and thousands of points. Formula One, take note. But this system is a little silly. However, is it as silly as... Eel. Yeah, you heard me. Eel. I had this idea for a championship system a while ago. Basically, it's like winner stays on. That doesn't really work in Formula 1 because then we'd need 19 new drivers every single race. So instead, we do the inverse of that and after every race, we kick out the person in last place. Everyone except last, or as I like to call it, the Eel Championship. This system works as long as you have more races and drivers. Obviously, Formula 1 drivers can turn up mid-season, and actually Mr. Kubica did do that to replace an unwell Raikkonen for two races. But I'm going to say you have to be there from the start to be eligible. I will allow a maximum of two races out on sick leave, so in theory, Raikkonen could still win the championship, but any more than two and you automatically get disqualified. So, applying this to 2021, we first lose Nikita Mazepin on turn three of lap one in the first race. We then lose Latifi in Imola, Raikkonen in Portugal, etc, etc. Mick Schumacher is the first person to actually finish a race and still get knocked out. And then we obviously lose Verstappen at the British Grand Prix on lap one. Hamilton too gets knocked out in Monza after crashing with no one. And so by the end of the season, we are left with our final two, Carlos Sainz Jr. and Daniel Ricciardo. Our title decider will be Brazil. It's a close race. Science leads most of it, but these two do change the lead a couple times due to pit strategy. They are seconds apart until on lap 49, no they aren't because Daniel Ricciardo's engine gives up. He's knocked out of contention, crowning Carlos Sainz, the 2021 F1 Eel champion. What an honor. Okay, okay. I will admit these point systems are getting a bit out of hand now. Speaking of hands though, Balatro is a video game where you make poker hands to score chips. Your score for each hand is worked out as a number of chips times a multiplier. Cards add chips based on their face value and then better hands give bigger multipliers. Oh, and then the game also has these joker cards which each have an interesting effect. The game starts out simple enough, but by late game, less simple. For this, we can use Formula 1's normal points as an equivalent to chips, but I have to take some creative license with the multiplier system. I think it makes sense you get a plus one multiplier for each race for finishing the points, which does not reset over the season. And also, you get a times 0.5 multiplier for each consecutive podium finish. So your first podium is times one, then times 1.5, times two, etc, etc. This does reset if you finish off the podium, so you better stay consistent. 10 bonus chips for the fastest lap and 10 bonus chips for a pole position. Why? Because I said so. Ignoring sprint races, we apply this system to 2021 and the graph starts out normal enough until we get... Oh, you can see here that before the final race, Hamilton is actually leading. 
but Verstappen then has a monstrous time in Abu Dhabi. 25 points for the win, 10 for fastest lap and 10 for pole position, all of that times 20 for points finishes times another 4.5 for consecutive podiums, meaning in this weekend he scores 4,050 points in a single race. I may have, um, this system might be a little bit broken. I do think it's good to reward consistency, but uh, yeah. Okay, okay, this system is a little far-fetched. But is it as far-fetched as? Super Mario Brothers is a classic platformer game that I don't feel like I have to explain. Please don't tell me you haven't heard of this. Anyway, even though it has no bearing whatsoever on your ability to progress through the game, Super Mario Brothers does have a point system. There it is. Obviously, one of the main ways you can score points in Mario is by stomping enemies. But sadly, Formula 1 does not have any Goombas or other miscreants roaming around a Formula 1 track for our drivers to smash their butts into. However, there is one other key way that you can score points in Mario games, the flagpole. As soon as you touch the flagpole in a Mario level, you score points in three different ways. One, you score points depending on how quickly you finish the level, with 50 points for each second left on the clock. We can do the exact same thing in Formula 1 basically, we give 3000 points for the winner, and then these tick down by 50 every second. Finish 10 seconds behind the winner, you get 2500 points. Finish 1 minute or more behind the winner, you get 0. Two. You score depending on how high up you catch the flag. The most you can score for this is 5,000 if you catch the thing at the very top of the pole, then 4,000, 2,000, 800, 400, and 100. In Formula 1, we can quite easily simulate this by just assuming that the flag cycles down once every second. Driver's total race time is measured to the 1,000th of a second, so we can just use this decimal to work out how high they catch the flag. Between 0.9 and 0.999, you score 5,000 points. Between 0.7 and 0.899, 4,000 points, etc, etc. And then third, and finally, you can score bonus firework points, depending on how much time you have left on your clock. Now, to add an extra element of randomness, and also because I misunderstood it while I was programming this, I didn't use the time difference between you and the leader. I instead used the same fraction of a second that we use for the flagpole. You can get either one, three, or six fireworks worth 500 points each, depending on the numbers that are in your time. Reading from right to left, if any of these three numbers show up, up in your time, you get these points. If your time is something like 0.845, you get nothing. Using all of this, the maximum points available in a race is 11,000. Assuming that you win the race and get a fraction of a second, something like 0.996. Sprint races are treated exactly the same as normal races. After all, they're just short levels. Oh, and also, if you get lapped, you score zero. If you don't finish on the final lap of a race, you haven't got to the end and therefore didn't reach the flagpole. Now, for anyone wondering, no one ever managed to get 11,000 points in a race. The most was actually 10,550 scored by Kimi Raikkonen in Azerbaijan. He finished 9 seconds behind the leader with a total race time of 2 hours, 13 minutes and 45.986 seconds. So, I coded all of this up and applied it to 2021. I was expecting this season to look a lot more random, with all kinds of midfield drivers scoring enormous points on the flagpole. But actually, Verstappen and Hamilton come out as clear, immediate favourites. What the hell? I suppose these two are picking up the most points on the gap to leader, and also there's lots of races where they basically lapped everyone, and so didn't let anyone else score. However, as the season progresses, Max Verstappen, who has been so strong across the rest of the multiverse, starts to fall behind. Hamilton's pole game is just too strong. Max does have a late season charge, but he cannot overcome Hamilton, who finishes the season 129,050 points, the Formula 1 Mario System champion. To all the Hamilton fans out there, take solace in this, it is possible. It took a complete reality shift and a point system with very little if not nothing to do with what happens on track, but there is a universe out there where Lewis Hamilton is the 2021 champion. If you've got any suggestions for other point systems that Formula 1 should use to make things even sillier than this, let me know down below. Like this video if you liked it and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Until that time though, I've been Mr V and I'll see you guys later.